Master Chef has seen some incredible dishes, but these chef failures are the most embarrassing of all time, especially this first one right here. This is the worst possible thing that could have happened. In season seven, episode 10's pressure test, Diamond was in for a rough ride. When the judges announced the challenge, it looked easy at first. Sausage in a bun. <laughs> but of course, there was more to it. There's always more to it. The contestants had to start from scratch, and Christina gave them a heads up about just how tough this was going to be. Sausage in a bun. <laughs> this wasn't a simple task. One mistake with the casing, and it's game over. The cooks had 60 minutes to mix their meat and seasoning, stuff it in a casing, and get it on the judge's table. The pressure was on. Ramsey checked in on Diamond early on, and things seemed fine. Sausage, I like chicken, it's a lean protein, but I'm using the thighs to help with the juicy so garnish the sausage. She added an Italian touch for the topping. Garlic, basil topping, kind of like a bruschetta. Don't waste too much time dicing that, you should grace it. But Ramsey gave her a heads up to use a grater instead of dicing cheese by hand, given the time crunch. Strange she didn't think of that herself. That was just the first mistake. With 10 minutes left, Diamond had her sausages ready and started cooking, but Christina spotted an issue that would come back to bite her. John, and there was no color. color. Damn. Diamond, diamond, diamond. If the judges see a problem before you even plate, you're in trouble. When it was time for tasting, Ramsey was initially impressed with the presentation, but the real test was inside the sausage, and Diamond failed spectacularly. That doesn't look like it's cooked. Ramsey didn't even need to taste it to know it was raw. He sliced it open, hoping to salvage something, but nope. Need to salvage this side, it's actually worse. Yeah, that's crazy. So that at that point, it was like she hadn't cooked them at all. This should have sent Diamond packing, but she got lucky. Time was up. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it Another contestant, Andrea, was disqualified for being three seconds late to the judge's table, even though that her dish was fantastic. Andrea, one of the season's youngest and strongest competitors, was suddenly out. Meanwhile, Diamond couldn't believe her luck. That was literally her only way out, and she took it. But in the next episode, she showed why she wasn't meant to be there in the first place. In episode 11, Terry chose bibimbap for the rice base challenge. Diamond wanted to stand out, but ditching all tradition was a bad move. Ramsey wasn't impressed with her take on it. She tried to explain herself, but Ramsey wasn't having it. This has to be one of the ugliest dishes I've seen so far tonight. He managed to both compliment and insult her in one breath, but that wasn't going to soften the blow. Eaten, and that's the leftovers. The dish had dull colors, sloppy knife work, and a loaf of bread on top of the rice. And then Ramsey found the sauce, thick and heavy, reminding him of one thing in particular. I didn't think it would get any worse. Ramsey wasn't holding back. And honestly, it was more like poutine than bibimbap. Ramsey bravely tasted it, and yep, it was just as bad as it looked. The beans are heavy, I get the rice and beans, I get all that. But you've macerated all that rice with that heavy, stodgy gravy. Diamond admitted it was her first time making the dish. No surprise there. In the end, Diamond's dish was the worst of the night. And unlike last time, there was no one to save her. She left MasterChef in one of the most embarrassing ways possible. But at least she didn't get a third strike. But Diamond was far from MasterChef's only disaster artist. Now. Let's take a step back to season three for a minute here, because long before Diamond was drowning bibimbap in gravy, the contestants were facing yet another deceptively simple pressure test, and one of them was confident they could nail the dish. Actually, save me. Your pressure test today. When it comes to Italian cuisine, Joe's already demanding standards go through the roof, and meeting his expectations isn't something just anyone can do to do this at all. Is it clear? Yes. Sure. Focused. Intuition and finesse were the name of the game. If they wanted to make perfect tortellini, Joe knew it was a pretty hard challenge. And so he took it upon himself to show them how it was done. So that the top level of pasta sticks to the bottom level. This was honestly the first time I saw the man work his hands with such grace. 
For someone who wasn't even a trained chef, that was really impressive. But none of the contestants were either, so there was an even playing field at least. Now Anna, despite being so confident like 10 seconds ago, ran into trouble even as soon as she started kneading the dough. In the beginning, I have never made tortellini before, but I cook pasta at home for my kiddo all the time. But it was only going to get worse from there. And in spite of the fact she got a master class on the subject moments earlier, there was something grossly wrong with her technique. Anna was butchering her tortellini, literally. She was poking holes into the dough left, right, and center, dooming the filling to ooze out the moment it hit the water. But for some strange reason, Anna assumed she had everything under control with three minutes remaining on the clock, as if things couldn't have gotten any worse. Anna realized something that very well could seal her fate. Name is off. A, I with a scant two minutes left, Anna started to panic. Boiling, you're out of the game. Joe didn't even have to say a word when he got his hands on the slop Anna dared to bring up. She could tell that her pasta was raw just watching him chew into it. As for Joe's reaction, he simply walked away. When I saw this go down live, I absolutely expected some next level trash can action, but not today, I guess. Anyway, Anna expected that at least Graham would share some feedback, given how kind he is by default compared to Joe and Ramsey. But once again, nothing. The tension was at its peak as Ramsey made his way over, and he finally said what the others didn't even bother to. That's his rule. Anna knew that her chances of surviving the night were slim to none, very much leaning towards none. Anna paid the price for using a food processor to make the dough, poking holes into the tortellini, and not even cooking it through. Although Tanya came very close to getting eliminated, Anna was ultimately sent packing. And I mean, thank God! If Tanya had taken the bullet for Anna and predicted the H with the Andrea Diamond incident four years before it happened, I don't think I'd have ever gotten over it to be honest with you. Next up, we're diving into some juicy moments from MasterChef Season 2, Canada Style. The blue team, led by Line the Culinary Commander Pelletier, was in serious trouble. And this wasn't just any kitchen drama. Line's military background was front and center. Get ready, because what went down during this didn't, that's gotta sting. But what happened next was even worse. In episode 5, Ramsay revealed a massive new twist in the show's format. Starting from tonight, you'll cook alongside everyone else from your home region. Yeah, and the one who prepared the best dish would earn the oh-so-coveted MasterChef immunity pin, which ensures their safety from elimination in the next challenge. Moreover, winning the pin would also save their entire region from elimination to boot. Mark my words, this will be the most strategic season of MasterChef. Now, it's no secret that I absolutely despise this mechanic, especially since it took the pressure test concept down with it. I'll save you the rant, but get in the comments if you want to see me yell into my microphone for 30 minutes about how much I hate it. Anyway, back to my rant about all the do-nothings that have taken up way too much space on this show. So, something something, 60 minutes on the clock for their state fair dish, something something, and they dove into the pantry to get started. Seriously stop me if you've heard this one before. In the beginning you get an idea and you think you know where you're going, but you're taking fair foods and you're trying- Now, on to the interesting stuff. That's Richie, and he was deep in the weeds here. Now, Ramsey looked a bit worried about Richie's ability to elevate his dish. Savory. So it's a cheesecake filling with caramelized bacon. Oh, sticky. When the judges revealed the worst three plates of the night, he was up first with a deconstructed cheesecake. Gosh, don't even get me started on how most deconstructed stuff feels like the chef has given up. Featuring a mascarpone crema, graham cracker crust, berry compote, and candied bacon. Despite the extensively elaborate description, Aaron found it underwhelming. Can't see State Fair realized I just see garnishes. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. Ramsey admitted the bacon was tasty, but felt the dish lacked sophistication like he suspected. To a dish. Had you put a little pound cake or something in the middle. Joe also ripped apart his dish and him for not getting the memo. We didn't listen to what we asked for today. 
this dish would make an excellent ice cream topping. But he somehow survived that night, because why not say announce that the regional part of the competition was officially over, and honestly, thank God for that awful gimmick. Anyway, now any dish could be placed in the top or bottom. Starting right now, no more hiding behind the best cook in your region. When the home cooks lifted their mystery boxes, they found the U.S. Army rations. Their task was to turn these humble ingredients into gourmet dishes. Ramsey then introduced Chef Andre Rush, a military veteran who has cooked at the White House for four U.S. presidents. And cooking became a passion of mine. Now, Joe explained they would have full access to the pantry. Well, most of it. The protein, however, was gonna be rationed out. But since Charles was on the winning team's last challenge, he got to pick first. And here I was, hoping that he wouldn't mess up. But I'm already talking about him, so I guess you know what happened. Later, Ramsey and Andre headed over to his station to check out his Thai dish. They tasted the sauce and found out that it had so much salt that Sam and Dean could hunt demons with it. Taste that. Man, what do you yeah. taste? A little bit salty. Yeah. To make things worse, the spice wasn't balanced either. It's good. Mm. What spice you put in there? Thai chili. That's way too spicy. When the judges called out the worst dishes of the night, he was obviously called forward with his Thai crusted halibut with vermicelli noodle salad. See, Ramsey thought it didn't look elevated, though they managed to fix the curry's heat. Ah, uh, Sri, small comforts, considering the strawberry jam in the noodles. Thing for me tonight is the strawberry jam noodles. What were you thinking? Seriously, where do they come up with this stuff? But wait till you hear his explanation. S citrusy. Shall we? But that wasn't the end of it. Andre had a bone to pick with the fish while Aaron emphasized that you can't combine rice and noodles in the same dish. Like, pick a starch, bro. Noodles, man. Choose one and do them great. Despite the obvious fact that his head was not in the game, he somehow survived only to perform worse on the show ahead. Moving on, in season nine, the judges were handing out only eight aprons each, and they would be mentoring their chosen contestants. So this time, the judges were battling it out too. But only mistake she made tonight, she chose the wrong judge. She doesn't need a chef. Oh, by the way, good luck to anyone who chose Joe as their mentor. By the second episode, he was down to just two aprons left. If a contestant is offered an apron by multiple judges, they get to choose their mentor. Now, Aaron was pretty clear with what he wanted. He wanted risk takers with passion. I really do. And the person that intimidated me prior coming in here was- Joe, on the other hand, was seeking out something a little different. My aprons are going to people who already have great palate. But at his heart, Ramsey's a simple guy, and his wants here proved that. Entirely different from me, let me tell you. I'm looking for students. Anyway, the least talented person this season was by far Sal. His arrogance didn't sit well with the judges, including his mentor, Joe, so you know how bad it must have been. He was inconsistent as heck and never quite matched his confidence with performance. Speaking of the challenge, it was time for the inaugural mystery box. Each contestant had an ingredient that represented their home state. We want to see you turn that incredible ingredient in front of you into a dish. The winner of this challenge would snag a major advantage in the next round. They had just one hour to impress the judges, and right off the bat, they were confused about Sal's dish. I'm a little bit concerned about Sal. He was given the Santa Barbara spot prawn, and he's making a New Orleans dish. And, of course, he was in the bottom three. And the lifeline he whipped up was a pan-seared steak with red wine reduction sauce and Parmesan cheese mashed potatoes. I have an advantage because I grew up cooking steaks out over an open fire out on our ranch. Well, did he? Joe's digging the steak, but noticed it was cooked a little too much. Medium instead of medium rare. But if that was the only problem, well, you could forgive an extra 30 seconds on the protein. He's definitely missing some technique on the potatoes. The flavor of Parmesan is good, that's a plus. But with those gooey potatoes, not happening. Glue. That consistency means that you let the starch. And Aaron agreed, suggesting the sauce could use some refining. It's at all. It's very reduced. It's gelatinous. It needed to be developed. And, well, 
That's how Sal spent his last day in the MasterChef kitchen. The guy went out as he lived, completely forgettable. Season 10, Episode 3 of MasterChef had its highs and lows. But this guy right here? He stole the show for all the wrong reasons. So what led him to this fate? Let's find out. So I have to step it up moving forward. This challenge was a tribute to 10 seasons of MasterChef and Ramsay's relentless dedication. The star ingredient? A choice between three of Ramsay's favorite proteins, pork chop, rack of lamb, and of course, scallops. The chefs had to bring their A-game because messing up one of Ramsay's favorites was playing with fire. And to make it even tougher, Importantly, tonight's dish should be inspired by me and my personality. They had to infuse Ramsay's personality into their dishes, a challenge the judges didn't hesitate to tease Ramsay about. Can be tough. <laughs> but jokes aside, they had 60 minutes and full access to the pantry to create something that screamed Gordon Ramsay. Hopefully, nothing that would make him scream. Now, back to Kenny. Kenny was feeling confident. In. Now. Peppers. Slice. But Joe wasn't buying it. He was more worried about how those scallops would turn out than Kenny's big smile. Any seasoned chef would test one scallop first, then adjust. But Kenny? He threw the whole batch in at once. Joe wasn't convinced this would end well. The chance to have my restaurant, you're all gonna be able to get that home cooking experience. There. And honestly, Joe had a point. Kenny was in over his head, rushing without a plan. It was all or nothing. Either those scallops would be perfect or a disaster. Given the vibe of this video, you can guess where this is going. Despite Joe's pressure, Kenny started to feel the heat. Fast forward to the tasting, because the rest of the cook? Not really worth mentioning. Kenny served up pan-seared scallops with mushroom, roasted potatoes, and mushy peas. Kenny was proud, but the plating didn't exactly scream Ramsey. Next up, we have Whitney Bray from season five on the list. Whitney's journey kicked off like most others, facing a nerve-wracking audition in front of everyone's favorite tough judges. At this point, she was just hoping to do well enough to snag that apron. And what do you know? She did. Whitney joined the 40 lucky contestants out of like 10,000 who made it through. Not bad. Quarter million dollars would give me the opportunity to finish culinary school. As the competition picked up, so did the intensity. Whitney soon found herself staring down the infamous mystery box challenge. I have chocolate, bananas, strawberries, blueberries. To whip up a dessert with those limited ingredients, creativity was key. But guess who won? Great job. Well done. Not Whitney, but Courtney took the win. Yeah, their names rhyme, but they're definitely different people. Anyway, this was before MasterChef switched to those dreaded instant eliminations. So Courtney had a big decision to make in the pressure test. To tell us who you'd like to save from elimination. So first pick. Sadly, Whitney didn't make the cut. As the clock ran down, Whitney poured everything into her dish, hoping it would save her spot in the competition but it just wasn't her day. She went bold with a Caribbean meatloaf, but it didn't quite hit the mark. Despite her confidence, the judges weren't impressed and quickly pointed out the dish's flaws. It has the mushrooms going through it and these other things, but it doesn't really taste like anything. Ramsey didn't hold back, delivering some hard truth. It's way overcooked, it's bland, you know. And then came the finishing blow. Mind, for me, was a TV dinner. They weren't done yet, though. One more tough critique. Taking a TV dinner and turn it into a TV disaster. Finally, Whitney had to face the reality of her elimination. Her dreams of culinary success were cut short. But she left with her head held high, ready to keep pushing forward. I'm going to continue working, saving up money so I can finish culinary school, because I still want to finish. Even after leaving, Whitney inspired others to never give up no matter how tough the challenges might be. Anyway, believe me when I say this, things got wild in episode four, in no small part due to Jenna's antics. This episode was all about embracing the flavors of China, 
As the mystery box winner, Whitney got to choose the main ingredient for the challenge. She had three options, Chinese mushrooms, oranges, or duck. And guess what Whitney went with? Mandarin oranges. Yes! Yep, mandarin oranges. Not everyone was thrilled about that choice. And the tension was immediate. Come on, baby, come on. There is gonna be elimination. Can you blame them? Chinese cuisine isn't something you can just nail in an hour. Even Ramsey struggled when he tried mastering Chinese dim sum on Kaz, the F word. Let me know if you want me to cover that show sometime. But coming back to Jenna. So, we're, Jenna presented her orange stir fry. I get it, orange chicken. But that wasn't the real issue. It's to go. Right. And food dies as it sits in the window. It had been 20 minutes since Jenna plated her dish and Ramsey was concerned it might have dried out or gone cold. Then Joe stepped up to taste it. And when he took a bite, well, you saw the title. This is the problem. Way to poke the bear, Jenna. After enjoying the dish, Joe gave the other contestants a reality check. It's not the spirit of what we came here to do. He wasn't impressed and straight up called it boring. I was expecting more drama, but Joe's frustration was totally justified. You can't just play any random dish and expect to win. Joe was like a warning bell. The other judges didn't even bother tasting it. This is Master Chef. Joe reminded everyone of a crucial point. Best amateur chef in America. Who's here to do that? The gloves were off, and they weren't coming back on. 100%, and if you're not, you should probably just leave your apron and you check yourself out right now. He didn't hold back, did he? And Jenna just stood there, realizing the chaos she'd stirred up. Joe's disapproval definitely shook her confidence. But hey, that's Joe for you? This may have been one of the first times Joe dismissed a dish, but it sure wasn't the last. Now, season three of MasterChef was an absolute roller coaster. And episode 15, that just sealed the deal. During the elimination challenge, one contestant really stole the show for all the wrong reasons. So there's Josh, standing there with sweat starting to form on his forehead as the challenge is revealed. We're making a dessert. But here's the kicker. They had to make a dessert using something you'd never think of. Corn. Yep, corn. Not exactly the go-to choice for a sweet treat. Josh started off confident, but that confidence drained fast as he fought through this nightmare challenge. What you're looking at is corn cream brulee with corn caramel. And honestly, this dish was doomed from the start. Joe thought the same. One glance at Josh's creation, and let's just say he wasn't impressed. Appetizing. Pretty much everyone agreed. But wait, there's more. If it had just been the presentation, we'd have another Adrian situation on our hands. But Josh wasn't so lucky. Way too sweet. Things weren't going his way. So Josh tried defending his dish, thinking it might help. But it totally backfired. No surprise there. Joe made his disappointment crystal clear. But Josh wasn't having it. Sent you home once. That's bad. This unlikely tag team finally started to break through Josh's defenses. Every second that passed made it harder for Josh to handle the criticism. When deliberations came, Josh was on the edge. The judges had made up their minds, and the three worst dishes were called up. Josh was in deep trouble, but at least he had Felix and David to share in the misery. For the rolls, Felix, I mean, those were so bad. As Josh stepped forward, ready to face the music, something unexpected happened. You are going back to your station. He survived. Despite all the heat, the judges decided to give Josh another chance. Maybe they saw a spark of potential beneath his disaster of a dish. But whatever it was, Josh's reaction was priceless. Total disbelief mixed with gratitude and relief. Maybe a little panic too, realizing he'd probably never live this down. Talk about a close call. But for the next contestant, 
Missing the mark was practically her specialty in this one challenge. From completely botched plates to basic mistakes, these moments left the judges in utter disbelief. Viewers were definitely invested in his journey throughout the season, but here's the twist. They were actually rooting for him to fail. That's how infuriating Tali Clavija was. To put it simply, the guy was incredibly delusional. I told you! Now, if you've even casually followed MasterChef, you definitely know who Tally is. Seriously, the guy is notorious. If you're searching for videos about the worst dishes or chefs to ever compete on MasterChef, you're bound to see Tally's name pop up almost immediately. It's a no-brainer, really. Honestly, it wouldn't be surprising if someone mistakenly added him to a Hell's Kitchen list, considering how wild and chaotic his cooking style could be. From the very start, it was clear to everyone that cooking wasn't exactly Tally's strong suit. Take the first mystery box challenge, for example. After securing a win, Felix earned herself a golden ticket to the pantry, which came with a significant advantage. Most intimidating dishes. I'm down. Even though I was practically... You'll be cooking one of our three most intimidating dishes. Um, she got the power to select the type of fish her fellow contestants had to work with, though the overall theme was still in the judges' hands. Because it's so difficult to execute, and it's a dish that takes me back to my grand. And, as you might have guessed, Joe picked a classic. Italian risotto. But that wasn't the end of it. Graham decided to go with the timeless New England clam chowder, while Chef Ramsay, in true Ramsay fashion, opted for his signature dish, the infamous beef wellington. Practice. Phoenix out of Joe. I mean, who's really surprised by that lineup? So, with three iconic dishes laid out before her, what do you think Felix chose for the challenge? Was a stunning risotto. Of course it had to be the risotto. What else would it be, right? Once Felix revealed her choice, the other contestants got straight to work, each trying to whip up a risotto that could transport Joe back to his grandmother's kitchen. When Tally burst into the pantry, his eyes lit up at the sheer variety of ingredients laid out before him. It was like a playground for the adventurous cook. Need to make awesome risotto. Risotto, it doesn't have to be. But Hold on a minute. Xanthan gum, sodium alginate, tapioca maltodextrin, tally buddy. Are you sure you even know what half of that stuff is, let alone how to use it all in a risotto? It wasn't just me raising an eyebrow. Even Felix, watching from the sidelines, had her one doubts. The guy was diving in head first, completely clueless. All this, it looks like Tali has never made risotto before. It looks like Dave Matt. And it wasn't long before the judges hopped aboard the Felix doubt train. And out of his comfort zone, his technique is all. Put cranberries in there. I mean, there's certain things that never go in a- Here's the thing about Tally. He's always convinced that he's breaking new ground, cooking up something so out of the box that it'll blow everyone away. But the reality? He ends up making a mess that's impossible to fix. As Chef Ramsay would say, this guy was practically a magnet for disaster. Soon enough, the clock hit zero, and it was time for the judges to finally try Tally's so-called masterpiece. Joe is definitely the scariest judge. He's the judge to win over. But before we even get to their reactions, let's just take a moment to examine his dish, shall we? Because honestly, this creation needs to be analyzed by scientists. Though not for any good reason, Joe was the first to take a look at the dish. And from the get-go, you could see him puzzling over the mishmash of ingredients on the plate. What's this? What's this baby powder looking stuff here? That's hazelnut and... Baby powder was one way to describe it and not in a complimentary sense. But even after Tally's explanation, Joe's opinion wasn't exactly favorable. Bit of, um... You know what it is, it's garbage is what it is. You could practically hear the offense in his voice. That's how bad Tally's dish was. I mean, how do you take something as straightforward as risotto and turn it into a complete catastrophe? One thing's for sure, Tally's got a unique talent, but unfortunately, it's the talent for ruining perfectly good ingredients. As for Ramsay, well, let's just say he wasn't exactly raving about Tally's dish either. The cranberries, the nuts, the gooseberries, already just unheard of in a risotto. 
that. When Ramsey calls something a disaster, you know he's not exaggerating. He means every single word of it. So, with a dish like that, it's no surprise that Tally wasn't exactly headed for the top three. But here's the thing. Tally didn't seem bothered in the slightest. While the judges huddled together to decide who'd be sent home, Tally was off in his own world, having a deep chat with his best buddy, and we all know who that is. So I'm gonna be the one to take him out. <laughs> Talk about friendship goals, right? That little conversation just goes to show how determined Tally was to stick around, even if it meant throwing someone else under the bus. But here's a thought, Tally. Maybe just focus on cooking properly instead. That way, you wouldn't have to scheme your way to the top. Anyway, the judges finally returned with their decision. Even seemed to know what a risotto was supposed to be. That dish. Was anyone really shocked? Yeah, I didn't think so. Even after landing in the bottom, Tally still seemed completely out of touch with reality, convinced that his dish wasn't that bad. Let's be honest, it was absolute trash. But despite that, Tally dodged elimination, which meant everyone else had to put up with more of his epic screw-ups. Fun times, right? After the show, Tally kept cooking, but not in any professional capacity. Instead, he found his way into the tech world, landing a job as a recruiter for a startup called Wag Labs Inc. Eventually, he moved on to become head of talent at Lucky Day. And yeah, he's still jamming on his guitar and making music. I guess it took MasterChef for Tali to discover where his true talents really lie. Next up, let's dive into the story of a contestant who didn't just annoy his fellow competitors, but also managed to push the judges to their limits at almost every turn. I'm the flash and nip. Some I'm talking about none other than Ryan Uman. In my opinion, Ryan from season 3 was hands down the most unpopular contestant of that entire season. His arrogance and constant boasting didn't just rub people the wrong way, it even made some of the female contestants uncomfortable with his creepy, off-putting comments. If ever there was a time to flash a nip. To kick things off, Ryan introduced himself to the judges with an over-the-top title, calling himself the Flavor Elevator. He bragged about how he'd spent thousands of dollars at fancy restaurants on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. But here's the kicker, he wasn't just bragging for the sake of it. Ryan genuinely believed he could recreate those high-end dishes at home and even do them better than the professionals. I own, and not only can I do this at home, I can do it better than theirs. You can almost feel the cockiness radiating from him right from the start, can't you? But that's not all. Throughout the season, Ryan kept insisting that he was one of the best cooks in the competition, confidently claiming he had what it took to win the whole thing. However, despite all that self-assurance, Ryan didn't get very far. He ended up being eliminated early, finishing in 14th place overall. Now, Ryan was pretty much a jerk for the entirety of his time on the show, but if I had to pick one moment that perfectly captured his arrogance, it it would be during the first mystery box challenge. So picture this, Ryan was the first contestant called to the front, thinking he had landed a spot in the top three. And of course, he wasted no time showing off that trademark confidence. I'm really not surprised that my plate is one of the top dishes. These other cooks are gonna have to step up their game. He was practically oozing with self-assurance, sure that he had nailed it. But as they say, pride comes before a fall, and Ryan should have held off on celebrating because guess what happened next? Worst three dishes of this mystery box challenge. Yep, that smug grin quickly disappeared when he realized that the judges had actually selected his dish as one of the worst three inches of the day. Honestly, it was a well-deserved reality check for all that self-righteousness. Moving on, let's talk about the military challenge, where Ryan once again brought his usual holier-than-thou attitude to the table. But of course, he didn't stop there. Even though Ryan was on the winning team, he still found a way to mess things up by telling the women on his team to flaunt themselves to get more votes. Seriously, Ryan? If ever there was a time to flash a nip. Ladies. I'm not doing Dude. That. Do you have any dignity left, man? Now that we've established Ryan Uman's arrogant and misogynistic side, let's dive into his self proclaimed superiority complex. In episode 6, Ramsey managed to poke some fun at Ryan, but true to form, Ryan's self centered nature completely missed the joke. I'm gonna win the whole competition. Top 10? 
I'm gonna win the whole thing. Top five. There were moments when Ryan would occasionally step up and deliver a well-executed dish, but it didn't take long for his mean streak to rear its ugly head, like in this particular moment. What kind of a gives a live crab to the blind chick? Ryan had the chance to choose a protein for his fellow contestants, and in a shockingly cruel move, he gave Christine Ha, the blind home cook, a live crab to work with. To make matters worse, he did it with a smug smirk plastered on his face. It pierced me. But here's the best part. Christine went on to win the entire season, showing Ryan exactly where he stood just by being her true, authentic self. I'm sure that victory stung him real bad. Prove to Ryan that you did try to screw me by giving me live crab, but I turned around and made it into something awesome. Honestly, it was satisfying to see Ryan's massive ego not get him far in the competition. And to top it off, it was even more gratifying to watch his so-called friend betray him without uttering a single word. Chefs. Oh. Before brilliance comes mad. See that sneaky guy over there? He didn't even break a sweat. But hey, at least Ryan valued their friendship, right? Interestingly enough, Ryan had a bit of an epiphany after his time on the show. Whether it was karma, a wake-up call, or just plain self-reflection, Ryan has since turned his life around completely. Today, he's taken on the role of a motivational speaker, regularly posting about spiritual awakening on his social media. Well, what can I say? Good on him. As for the internet, here's what I got while digging more about him. One viewer said he wasn't one of the best on season 3, but he was way too overhated by fans. He was chosen to be the bad guy by producers and played into it. When he made a tasteless joke about the woman flashing the marines, I doubt he meant anything by it and it made him hated by the fans even more. If the network really felt it was this massive issue, then it never would have seen the light of day. Simply said, they cast him to be a villain, and people reacted to it. He was nowhere near as mean and arrogant as Christian's character in season two. Then, people took offense to him giving Christine a live crab because she's blind. He was playing the game the way it was meant to be played. Christine spoke on it and was happy and felt it meant Ryan respected and feared her as a competitor. This is a contest in which losers get prizes. There's one big grand prize, and he recognized Christine as a threat. The actual show later gave Christine a poisonous urchin and made her handle it, and nobody cared. The show is MasterChef, proving you can handle anything in a kitchen which Christine did. She wouldn't have wanted huge advantages just because she was blind. Joe's comment in the restaurant was way more vicious than anything Ryan did to her. By the way, Christine now has a live Dungeness crab recipe in her cookbook. Going by this comment, if at all anything, Ryan helped Christine get popular all the while pushing himself under the bus. But do you feel the same? Make sure to let me know in the comments below. Meanwhile, here's another contestant from season 3 who was clearly out of her depth when it came to what the competition demanded. In one of the season 3 challenges, Helene Leeds presented a risotto dish that was so disastrously bad. Calling it a failure would have been an understatement. Helene had created these dainty little baskets out of burdock root to cradle her scallops, but no amount of cute presentation could save her from the disaster that was her undercooked risotto. Soto and raw scallops. Joe Bastianich wasn't about to let that slide. In typical Joe fashion, he didn't hold back. He picked up some of Helene's food and, say it with me now, tossed it straight into the trash. Big shocker, right? In all seriousness, Helene was showing her lack of skills from the very beginning. And, unfortunately, this wasn't the only time she served up a dish that had everyone shaking their heads. Take, for example, the fresh versus canned elimination test. Here's what Helene was assigned to cook. What to do with it? She's definitely not a threat. But instead of taking it as a straightforward challenge, she saw Ryan's choice as a strategic move, believing he viewed her as a weaker competitor and wanted to trip her up. But credit where it's due, despite all that pressure, she handled the live crab with surprising confidence. Look a crab, I know how to pick a crab, and I know- She even took a moment to guide fellow contestant Tanya on how to handle her own live crab. During the cook, Ramsey swung by Helene's station and immediately noticed the chaos surrounding her. Greetings from there, I know. all the way to here. I like options what in the me. hell are you doing? How many dishes are you doing? With a mix of frustration and disbelief, he managed to ask her about her dish. 
Helene explained that she was making a tomato-based crab soup and assured Ramsay that she was focusing on just one portion. But Ramsay, always the stickler for details, reminded her of something crucial. I haven't seen you win anything yet. I've been struggling. You've been struggling. I've been Why? struggling because... I Helene then admitted that she was struggling, particularly when it came to working under pressure. Ramsay was taken aback by this confession and asked her if she had any idea what was coming next. As he walked away, Helene realized that the competition was only going to get tougher from here on out. It was clear she needed to either step up her game or she'd be on the chopping block soon. Unsurprisingly, when Helene presented her dish to the judges, Joe had some serious concerns. Helene also, same thing. I think that she has no idea what she... And it wasn't just Joe. Graham also chimed in with his own critique. She's from the eastern shore of Maryland. That's like... Crabville, you know? She should be able to do this blind. And honestly, he's not wrong. Anyone from Maryland should have at least some decent skills when it comes to a crab challenge, if not completely dominate it. But of course, things didn't exactly go as planned for Helene. When it was time for her to present her crab soup with cornbread, Helene admitted that the soup turned out thicker than she intended, but assured the judges that it still had the flavors and style she was aiming for. Joe Bastianich was the first to try her dish. You've done a great job of, um... In a surprising or maybe sarcastic twist, he praised her for somehow making fresh crab taste like canned crab. Yeah, on second thought, that was definitely sarcasm. Graham, on the other hand, had a slightly different take. Almost more like a jambalaya or something. You know, when you put that on, on a fork, it looks... He likened it to jambalaya and noted that the shredded crab was so indistinct it might as well have been cereal on his fork. But, being Graham, he managed to take his critique up another notch. Waste of a great product. Let's just say, this was far from Helene's finest moment. Honestly, I'm not sure she ever really had one, but you get the idea. And believe it or not, things got even worse. Ramsay dipped the cornbread into the soup and immediately noticed something was off. Is that salt on top of the... Uh... He asked Helene if she had bothered to season the cornbread at all. Her response? She admitted to adding just a pinch of seasoning. But Ramsey wasn't having it. If you asked me to pay $25 for that, uh, I wouldn't pay you. It's always the seasoning, isn't it? At this point, Helene was not only shocked, but also completely embarrassed. And honestly, who could blame her? Unsurprisingly, Helene found herself in the bottom four. After Frank and Mike were safe and returned to their stations, Ramsey gave Helene some advice, telling her that if she wanted to pursue a light, healthy cooking style, she needed to really deliver. Despite her best efforts, Helene was ultimately eliminated for all the reasons we've covered so far. Your time in MasterChef is done. Thank you. Please put your apron. Before she left, Ramsey did offer some words of encouragement, telling her to keep her head high and continue her education. If memory serves me right, Season 3 hit us with a challenge in Episode 10 that was crafted to separate the real kitchen experts from the amateurs, and... Trust me, it absolutely delivered on that promise. Now, pizza might seem like a simple enough dish, but nailing it perfectly, that's a whole other ball game. Enter Mike, who wasn't exactly brimming with confidence about his pizza, but was hanging his hopes on his trusty pizza stone to pull through for him. Unfortunately, when it came time to present his dish to the judges, it was clear they weren't exactly throwing a pizza party in celebration. To make matters worse, Mike let something slip that was sure to stir up some drama. Seems like stirring the pot might be becoming a bit of a habit for him. On this one, I would have loved to have given you a pizza. Really? Then, Aaron Sanchez weighed in with a comment that hit hard. He compared Mike's pizza to the Sahara, basically saying it was as dry as a desert. That's his way of letting Mike know that his dish was in pretty rough shape. Imagine a pizza so dry it could double as a sand dune. Yeah. It wasn't a pretty sight. Essentially, it was Aaron's polite way of hinting that Mike might want to consider packing up and heading home. If you told me to guess what piece of equipment you were given to cook with. But Mike wasn't ready to throw in the towel just yet. He attempted to explain where he went wrong, but Chef Ramsay wasn't having any of it. <clears throat> I just blanked out. All right. Sorry, Chef.
In the end, it's safe to say that Mike's pizza didn't exactly rise to the occasion. Mike's excuses didn't fly with the judges at all. And then, get this, in a moment that still leaves me scratching my head, Mike admitted that he completely zoned out while cooking. Seriously? How do you zone out in the middle of a high-stakes competition? The judges were not going to let that one slide. You didn't need to hear a word from Joe to know how he felt. Just one look at his face, and it was obvious. His expression said it all. And then, the ominous prediction dropped like a bomb. You didn't remember a dough recipe of any kind? I just drew him. At that moment, Mike must have known deep down that his fate was pretty much sealed. By the time the tasting wrapped up, it seemed like he had already accepted the inevitable. Is that somebody else screwed up worse than I did? He was holding on to a sliver of hope that maybe, just maybe, someone else had messed up even worse than he did. But let's be real, who could top making a pizza that dry? It's hard to imagine anyone out doing that. In the end, it was painfully clear Mike's pizza stone gamble didn't pay off, and he got sent packing that night. Blank. Hope there's not a blank space at your cooking station. But not everyone was thrilled with the outcome. Sure, Becky's attitude rubbed plenty of people the wrong way, but some folks believed David didn't deserve to go home either, especially since his dish ended up in the trash. And let's not forget Tally's raw flour disaster. Here's my take. Mike might not have been the season's shining star, but he definitely deserved a shot at redemption. I've got this sneaky feeling that there's more to his cooking skills than just that desert dry pizza we all saw saw. But hey, we're not done with the worst contenders from season 3 just yet. David Martinez had his own set of issues that are simply impossible to ignore. At first, David started off as a strong contender. He was passionate, logical, and respectable. Honestly, I thought he had a real shot at making it to the finale. Unfortunately, things took a sharp turn in the second half of the season. All those positive traits, they morphed into arrogance. Suddenly, he was argumentative and selfish, only caring about himself. This shift became crystal clear in episode 10, when David presented his dish. I roasted the potatoes in the pizza stone, I did the bacon in the pizza stone, and I did the uh, lot. The judges weren't having it really bad. Chef Graham didn't hold back, throwing shade at David's soupy disaster, comparing it to something straight out of a horror movie. And of course, Joe had to chime in with his signature sarcasm, hitting David with, you expect me to eat this? And as for Ramsey, his comment was so blunt it almost hurt to hear. Fell a thousand foot with nothing underneath it. Great shame. David looked like he'd been hit with a ton of bricks. While he did acknowledge his mistake, he struggled to defend himself against such harsh criticism. But guess what? There isn't a single thread on Reddit discussing the worst MasterChef dishes that doesn't feature David's soupy mess on the list. Yeah, whether or not he found a safe spot in the competition, he's definitely secured a place among the worst dishes ever served on MasterChef. And here's another kicker. One viewer even ranked him as the worst contestant of the season, placing Tally and Ryan above him. The viewers' reasoning? They saw David as a mean and lazy competitor who dodged blame in team challenges and made excuses in individual ones. You can read all about it here. Surely not top six material, they say, but what do you think? Now, Hold on before you make any final judgments about David. There's one more moment you absolutely cannot overlook. I'm talking about the mystery box challenge from episode 15. Believe it or not, David's dish actually landed him in the top three. David. As the winner, he got to choose the ingredients for the elimination round which happened to be desserts. Dor so a son sounds like a sweet deal, right? David had the power to pick from three ingredients provided by the judges, but here's where things took a nosedive. David wasn't too confident about using beets and figured others would shine with bacon, so he chose corn instead. He was then presented with three corn dishes and had to select one. I immediately know I'm gonna make rice pudding my mom makes an awesome- Before the challenge even began, David was given an extra five minutes to pick any additional ingredients he needed. And that's when the trouble began. As soon as the challenge kicked off, David made a major blunder. You wouldn't happen to have rice, would you, Christine? No, I don't. I'm sorry. 
Josh, do you have any rice? No rice. Can you believe it? He intended to make rice pudding, but completely forgot to grab the rice. Talk about a kitchen nightmare. Mistakes happen, sure. But on MasterChef, that kind of slip-up can be disastrous. In a frantic scramble, David had to beg other contestants for rice. Um, how much do you need? The smallest amount. Um, do you need all of it? No, I was gonna do that as a backup. Eventually, he managed to get some rice, but by then, the judges were practically facepalming in disbelief. They couldn't understand how someone could squander their advantage like that. So, did David manage to redeem himself with the rice? Let's just say, it didn't turn out quite as well as everyone had hoped. As the winner of the challenge, David was first in line to present his dish to the judges. Naturally, they were eager to hear about the whole rice debacle, and David had to explain his blunder in front of everyone. Unfortunately, all his explanations did little to impress the judges. His dish was pretty disappointing. It is a corn and milk based Joe was particularly blunt, leaving everyone stunned with his comment. It's really, really, really... And if you thought Joe's initial comment was harsh, just wait for his next remark. Unedibly disgusting. Joe was so underwhelmed by the dish's flavor that he even asked David if he had tasted it himself. When David mentioned that it reminded him of his mom's cooking, Joe made a really disrespectful comment about it. It's a place that I'm going to avoid. The other judges weren't much more impressed. They offered some constructive criticism, but it wasn't enough to save David from landing in the bottom three. To taste corn. I mean, some serious spices there. In the end, David narrowly avoided elimination, with Felix being sent home instead. Thank you. David, back to your bench. Personally, I would have eliminated David for forgetting the rice in his rice pudding. It was a pretty glaring mistake. Overall, it wasn't David's finest hour on the show, but at least he managed to dodge a bullet this time. Watch as this chef ruined her standing during this mystery box challenge. Courtney snagged the win and was given the power to control the first elimination challenge. First elimination test. Welcome to the Master Chef Pantry. She picked meatloaf, but here's where it gets juicy. We'll have to cook tonight. Wow. Now, brace yourselves, because Courtney had an advantage of saving 10 contestants, leaving the rest, including Stephanie, to battle it out. For this challenge, Stephanie seemed quite confident, but the judges had a different vibe. When the judges came snooping, they found her with a blue cheese cream sauce and couscous, which she had put on her lamb meatloaf. What are you doing with that? Putting it on top of my lamb meatloaf. Yep, you heard it right. Blue cheese on lamb meatloaf. Joe immediately responded saying, are you out of mind? Are you out of your mind? I might be, but you know, I'm, I'm trying to win. Stephanie laughed it off saying she's trying to win and you have to be a little out of your mind for that. Joe shot back. Do you want to go home? To that, Stephanie boldly replied. To win this competition and show America what I'm about, which is cooking. She wanted them to taste her food, saying she wasn't just a pretty face. She was there to win and show America what she's about, which is cooking. Stephanie went to the judges with her dish, which is lamb meatloaf with couscous, pepper ribbons, and blue cheese sauce. Those pepper ribbons and a blue cheese cream sauce. Firstly, Ramsey tasted her dish to which he says, Oh, blue cheese and couscous, that classic combo, wow! He immediately spat it out. That was a very dry combination with lots of chili flakes, blue cheese and couscous. On top of that, she has the guts to say that she took a risk, but Ramsey didn't like it. Either way, Ramsey wasn't having it. That's where you should be heading. He was seriously disappointed with her and made sure she understood that she got this one so wrong. Stephanie was feeling terrible as she returned to her counter and she felt like crap. Apparently, no one ever told her that her food wasn't good before. I just want to crawl under the nearest oven. In the end, she found herself in the bottom three. When the judges asked who she thought should go home, she didn't hesitate. Who we're about to send home and why? She thought Whitney was lacking that spark and did not have enough love and passion towards cooking. Courtney, 
Tonight. And guess what? Her intuition was spot on. Whitney got the boot, and Stephanie lived to cook another day. Your time is done in the MasterChef competition. Okay. Now, moving on. In episode four, MasterChef was serving up drama hotter than your morning coffee. Brace yourself as we dive into the delicious disaster that nearly sent our Miss Perfect Courtney packing. I'm screwed. I just start over. The second mystery box challenge is won by none other than Arhan and saves herself and gets to choose the elimination dish. And guess what? It's donuts! Oh no, Miss Perfect Courtney did something stupid putting her in some serious danger. Courtney, our golden girl, forgot to add eggs to her dough. Just when you think it couldn't get worse, she realizes she's out of guess what? Don't have any yeast. And here's Arhan's reaction after seeing Courtney all miserable over something. All I can really think is, my plan's working. Goodbye, Courtney. Arhan was practically gleeful watching Courtney struggle to get yeast. She wanted Courtney out of the competition. Desperate, Courtney went around begging for yeast, but no one had any. Just when it seemed hopeless, someone came to her rescue with the yeast she needed. In here, do you have any extra yeast? I love you. Yes, it was Francis. Now Courtney was a little relieved. Phew. Crisis averted, or so she thought. The contestants were ready to present their donuts to judges, but you have to see what happened next. Now have one more huge advantage. Aran gets another advantage of saving one contestant, and she very smartly leaves Courtney to fend for herself. Francis B, you have dodged the biggest bullet in this competition. Now, Courtney was first up to present her donuts box. And Aran's reaction? Pure satisfaction. For donuts, then you're kind of spit and you should go home. Aran had some rage with Courtney as we can see her reaction when Courtney went to judges with her donuts. Courtney stepped up, missing her signature heels, and presented her raspberry frosted and the chai glazed donuts. And you have to see Ramsey's reaction to her donuts. That's seriously salty. Ah. They were extremely salty. Courtney was soon to explain that it was a mistake, not intentional. But here's what Ramsey had to say to her next. It's like you've lost your heels, you've lost your mojo. You've peaked. Courtney tried to defend herself, saying she did hit a large bump. But Ramsey cut her off, saying, Sliding down the aerial faster than you got up there. What a shame. Next up, Graham stepped in, unimpressed with the dough's consistency. The technique is just not what it needs to be. Joe followed, equally disappointed. Courtney, almost in tears, admitted she was rushing to get the second batch of dough. And this left Joe frustrated. For me to love these donuts, it's hard for me to even like them. Courtney could only muster a I'm sorry, chef. Arhan, seizing the moment, threw shade. Perfect streak has been broken because her donuts taste like Courtney's catastrophic blunder landed her squarely in the dreaded bottom three, teetering on the edge of elimination. Right now, this is about making a better life for myself. Despite being in the top three for elimination, just when it seemed like all hope was lost, fate took an unexpected turn. Please put your apron on your bench. The time is done. The judges believed in her potential, and she was saved to cook another day. But here's another contestant who, despite their talent, occasionally made some pretty dumb decisions that ended up costing them dearly. In the electrifying episode five of season five, the heat was on. Leslie and Francis, the stars of the last donut challenge, were chosen as captains for the daunting task of preparing food for wedding guests. Leslie, in a series of dramatic choices, picked his team one by one, including Afran, who visibly did not want to be on his team. Awkward much? On Leslie's team, and he does not know how to communicate with people. Right off the bat, the blue team was calm, working in perfect rhythm. Meanwhile, Leslie's team, the red team, was a hot mess from the get-go. No strategy, no plan, just pure chaos. Red team begins prep under Leslie's unconventional leadership. 
it was clear from the start that Leslie's leadership was, to put it mildly, a disaster. The red team struggled to get on the same page, and the tension was palpable. After having a conversation with Leslie, Ramsey had something to say. Get your together now! But it wasn't enough to stop the meltdown. Leslie and Aran ended up in a heated argument with Leslie screaming his frustrations. The drama hit a fever pitch when the red team decided to overthrow Leslie and appoint someone else as their new captain. Point Francis B, the guy who had a successful team last time around. And Leslie's reaction? Priceless. Decided that I am out of control and I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, talk about Leslie trying to be the team partner. Anyway, Francis took the lead and things started to get better, but not without more drama. I don't want to see nobody else eat! The team had put themselves on the edge again. How many portions are we short? Two portions were short. Two portions. The red team found themselves two portions short of fish. Now, that's kind of embarrassing. As the challenge came to an end, the blue team emerged victorious, just as you guessed. But wait, there's more. Leslie and Aaron's feud didn't end there. Grow up and, and grow some balls. Everyone else was so fed up with Leslie. Of course I'm condescending because I'm tired of getting beat up by everybody here. As the red team failed in the wedding challenge now, they had consequences for their actions, which put them in the pressure test. Leslie, as the dethroned captain, had to choose three contestants to face the pressure test. Feeling betrayed, Leslie chose Aaron, Christian, and Daniel in what seemed like an act of revenge. But plot twist. It's not your decision. <laughs> <laughs> to that, Leslie's reaction was nothing but pure gold. First they nailed me to a cross on a beach, now they're gonna burn me at a stake. And guess who the judges picked first for the pressure test? Yes, Leslie. For the pressure test they were given to cook the dish that practically defined America, which is steak. Leslie seemed confident while making the steak. What's more, according to the judges, he had all right technique and stuff. But the drama didn't stop there. He was fuming as other contestant received guidance from the safe contestants. They didn't like me from day one because I'm the old guy. Anyway, it was time for Leslie to walk his dish to the judges. Seeing some raw dry herbs on Leslie's dish, Ramsey had some thought. It's on the plate. Just for design, no, no reason. Yet, when it came to the all important taste test, Ramsey was pleasantly surprised. The steak was perfectly cooked with a succulent medium rare that earned a rare nod of approval from the judge. However, Leslie's confidence took a hit when Ramsey moved on to the fries. But unfortunately, your fries are dreadful. Despite this setback, Leslie's dish stood out from the others. His culinary skills were striking and were enough to keep him from elimination. Good job. Please, go join your best friends up there on the balcony. Despite his culinary prowess, Leslie's journey was marred by dumb moves and unnecessary drama. Now, how many chances does one person get before it's just too much? The judges were disappointed with this contestant more times than we can count, and this episode was no exception. So, we've seen him fumble before, but this time he truly outdid himself. Episode 9 kicked off with a bang. The mystery box challenge winner was Christian. The lucky guy got to pick the ingredients for the dreaded elimination round. And what did he choose? None other than Joe's favorite ingredients basket. Talk about upping the stakes. Oh man, that's Joe's. Lots of wine. The basket was a mix of intriguing elements. But here's where it gets spicy. Christian had a massive advantage, and guess who he picked to bear the brunt? One hour to cook their dish. Courtney. Now, the rest of the contestants were left to fend for themselves. Rolling the dough with confidence, Cutter was in his zone. As Ramsey approached him, Cutter was quite confident, and here's what he decided to make in his elimination round. I'm going to do some little flatbread crisp pizzas. And what was Ramsey's obvious question? 
Why? Seriously, who the hell would think of making pizza in a neck-to-neck -neck elimination round? Come on, man. You are in the elimination round. You gotta think out of the box. But Cutter, being Cutter, had a plan. For his defense, he was saying he liked the ingredients, and he thought he could come up with a good dish. However, Ramsey's eye widened in disbelief. It's all about what Cutter likes again, not what the judges want to see. Yep. Well, here's our man Cutter making the pizza dough without the yeast. And he confidently said, I got some eggs and some baking powder. Ramsey, trying to mask his disbelief, shot back with a warning. Under 40 minutes to nail it. Good luck. Thanks. Anyway, soon it was time Cutter presented his dish. And Ramsey's reaction was priceless. That's it, chef. That's it. Holy mackerel. Christian gave. Is this what you were thinking too? Come on, man. You just can't serve something like that. Ramsey was quite disappointed to say the least. But Cutter was just being Cutter, and Ramsey wasn't having it. A basil, oregano. Hold on a minute. In fact, Ramsey couldn't hold himself back. My name's Gordon Ramsey, not Stevie Wonder. Ramsey was all over Cutter. Some mini pizzas come out. Maybe describe it again, and I'll try and hear it. Cutter, undeterred, defended his pizza's supposed artisan quality, but Ramsey's patience was wearing thin. Damn. And then came Joe. If Ramsey was frustrated, then Joe was livid. He was furious. He grilled Cutter on the ingredients. He fired back with a, do you know where the ground Parmesan cheese comes from? What milk it's made out of? And Cutter, clueless, responded with a no, we sir. Joe's patience was clearly gone, but Cutter was fumbling for answers and it only made things worse. Do you know what balsamic vinegar is? Now, here's how Joe responded. Why did you put sauce underneath it as well? Apparently, Cutter was just trying to get some color on the plate. Like, stop. Who would put the sauce underneath a pizza? The final blow came swiftly. Joe took a bit and spat it out. A waste of our time and your time in this kitchen. And after all this Cutter with unmatched audacity said, it pissed Joe off, it pissed Gordon off but I thought it tasted good, and it definitely be a piece of what I would order. Normally, the judges call out the three worst dishes to come down to the front, but this time they went with two dishes. What's more, the contestants had to take responsibility and own up. But guess who thought they had the best dish? Cutter, of course. But his confidence was misplaced, and he found himself once again facing elimination alongside Elise. Elise and Cutter, please make your way down. This was Cutter's fifth time in the bottom, and this is what the judges had to say. It's your stubbornness that's stopping you from taking it to the next stage. Cutter still believed he was better than Elise. And quite shockingly, Cutter was saved from elimination for the sixth time. Elise. Was this guy a favorite or just incredibly lucky? Who knows? But one thing's for sure, Cutter's journey in MasterChef continued, much to the judges and viewers' disbelief. But here's another contestant who took the risk of landing him and his partner in the dreaded pressure test. And it's not very pretty. Episode seven of season five had contestants facing a daunting task, the infamous surf and turf dish. They had only one hour to set aside their differences and work together to impress the judges. The twist came when Courtney, the last challenge winner, got to decide who would pair up. She strategically put Dan and Cutter together, a duo with clashing opinions. Almost immediately, Dan and Cutter had different opinions of what they should be making. You have two lean proteins going together, that's the only thing. Dan suggested a tuna sashimi, but Cutter, always vocal, argued against it. To what I'm trying to tell him, these proteins don't go together, you need something. Tension mounted in the pantry as their disagreement escalated. They were like oil and water, refusing to mix. They had a heated conversation in the pantry and wouldn't decide what to do. Clearly, they weren't getting along. In other words, Cutter was frustrated. Dan, on the other hand, was in shutdown mode. We're overthinking it. He muttered, lost in his own world, unable to decide on the vegetables. 
I think that's what he said. That's exactly what he said. He's going into Dan shutdown mode. Now, all they had were two types of protein that did not go together, and seven items in total in the pantry. Disaster was looming. Two proteins that do not pair together. Now, how would they be making a good dish out of all this and not to go home tonight? When Ramsey approached their station, eyeing the chaos, he was curious to know what they decided to whip up. They hastily described a bizarre concoction. Chilled venison slices with warm tuna chunks, soy sauce drizzled over like sashimi, and Ramsey's eyebrows shot up. The real kicker? Cutter and Dan were not on the same page. Dan goes off on a wild tangent in the pantry, and by the time we got out of there, we ran out of time. Seemed like Cutter got the worst partner for this challenge. And what was Ramsey's advice? And I'm like, let's not worry about it. Let's just put something on a plate. Come on, Dan. It's a challenge that can put you and your partner in the pressure test, not a picnic. Anyway, the moment of truth arrived, and they presented their dish to the judges. To keep things short, the plate was an embarrassment, empty and unappealing. And Ramsey's reaction was explosive. Is that? Cutter was not having it either. He was furious at Dan. He just starts grabbing and this is what you get, ran out of time in the pantry. Dan tried to defend himself, but Cutter wasn't having it. We didn't get enough ingredients to really make anything. To make things worse, when they described the dish, it was a mess. It was seared venison loin on a bed of cauliflower and parsnips. On the other side was seared tuna marinated in some ponzu yuzu soy on a three radish salad. Ramsey shook his head. Even the separate identities didn't work. Clearly, it was one of the worst dishes of the competition so far. Cutter was so embarrassed that it was like you don't even have to taste the dish. But that's when Joe decided to put him in his place. So why don't you let me figure out what I have to do and what I don't have to do. Joe's reaction to that dish was something. It was so brutal, the room went silent. So what was the aftermath? Dan, trying to stay calm, said, if I'm going to blame anyone, it's myself. But he couldn't help calling Cutter's actions cowardly. Cutter was really angry, knowing this disaster put them in the pressure test. His chances of going home were now very high. Next up, Francis, Elise. And just like you expected, they were in the bottom three teams facing elimination. And what was the lesson? In a team challenge, it's always better to put your heads together and plate one dish. Moving on, here comes a contestant who is unanimously hated by many viewers. Speaking of culinary disasters, Jeff from season eight really took the cake. In short, Jeff was a real hot mess. He had a terrible temper, was always getting into arguments, and never ran out of excuses for his constant blunders. It's safe to say that he thrived on negativity, bringing everyone down with his bad vibes. At the beginning, he started off strong and determined, ready to tackle each challenge head on. But then, out of nowhere, he took a massive nosedive into a pit of mediocrity. And when things didn't go his way, watch out, he would flip out and have violent outbursts that could catch anyone off guard. Under pressure, total meltdown. And as a team player, forget it. Jeff was the sorest loser you could ever imagine. Now, let me walk you through what happened during the mystery box challenge with a family reunion theme. Jeff had to create a savory dish inspired by his loved ones. Santa Claus. What? When he saw his fiance and son, he decided to make a soy glazed salmon with fancy accompaniments like miso, ginger, garlic cauliflower puree, and pickled radishes with Asian pears. But unfortunately, his dish didn't impress the judges enough to be considered a top entry. Then came the twist. The remaining contestants had to cook another salmon dish, but Kate, who had won the previous mystery box, got to assign different time limits to everyone else. 15 minutes, you'll shout out another name. Jeff got the shortest time limit of just 20 minutes, and he hurriedly rushed to the pantry to get things going. Certainly, I am one of the top chefs here. Little did he know, Kate actually wanted Jeff gone because of his poor attitude. 
His attitude is poor, so I want to send him home. So, despite his initial promise, Jeff's journey was marred by his temper, excuses, and constant underperformance, culminating in a less than stellar finish. But Jeff, bless his heart, was completely delusional. We have a little bit of feta cheese and sundry tomato relish. He genuinely believed that he was given the tightest time limit because he was considered the strongest cook in the competition. Can you believe that? It's a major misunderstanding of epic proportions. Anyway, the moment of truth finally arrived, and it was time for the judges to taste Jeff's dish. And at the end of the day, I don't think anyone else could have done better. He proudly presented his Mediterranean-style salmon with feta cheese and sun-dried tomato relish, served over an apple and cucumber gratin with a cranberry and stout beer sauce. Jeff was beaming with confidence, thinking he had nailed it. But oh boy, was he in for a rude awakening. Oh. Jeff was convinced that his dish was the best, but Ramsey was far from impressed. In fact, Ramsey was furious when he discovered that the salmon was raw. He accused Jeff of trying to poison him, which is a pretty serious allegation. Jeff tried to defend himself, claiming that he intentionally wanted the salmon to be rare. You saying you wanted it that rare? Yes. But Chef Ramsey was having none of it. He berated Jeff for not understanding the difference between rare and raw, which is a pretty basic culinary concept. And if that wasn't enough, Ramsey also found the combination of the salmon and the gratin to be utterly bizarre. It's like sushi, though. He even compared the salmon to sushi, which was not a compliment. Ouch, that's gotta hurt. As the judges deliberated, Dino cracked a joke about making sushi, which clearly rubbed Jeff the wrong way. Were we allowed to make sushi? No, couldn't be wrong. And then Jeff fired back with a scathing retort that left everyone stunned. I'm like a spaghetti and meatball. The tension escalated rapidly, and before long, a full-blown brawl erupted. In the end, Jeff found himself standing alongside Yachishia, awaiting the judge's verdict. He didn't care. But in a shocking twist, Ramsey eliminated both contestants. Jeff. According to Ramsey, Jeff's defensive attitude and refusal to learn from criticism sealed his fate. When asked about his feelings after the elimination, Jeff surprisingly shared some positive thoughts. I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank the three of you, so thank you. He also acknowledged that his attitude might have rubbed some contestants the wrong way, but he insisted he did his best. Support my team, oh. and I did the best that I could. All in all, Jeff's behavior was a recipe for disaster. A toxic mix of a short temper, childish antics, and a refusal to acknowledge his own flaws. It's no wonder his time in the competition ended in a spectacular crash and burn. Most people think that this was the final straw for Jeff. It must have really shaken his self-esteem and pushed him to quit. What do you think? I personally believe he could have exited with a bit more grace. All right, up next is Nathan. It was the fourth episode of season seven. 18 home cooks scrambled around like crazy to dodge getting reprimanded by Gordon Ramsay in front of everyone. Now, the top 18 contestants will be catering a wedding for MasterChef Season 6 alum Nick Nappy. Really good news, when's the wedding? Well, um... He and his fiance appear blissfully happy and smitten. Are you all ready to face your next challenge? But who really cares? Like most weddings, we're just here for the food, right? But you won't believe the craziness that was about to unfold. So, what happened is, following their last week's win, Nathan and Terry were appointed team captains for this challenge. However, Ramsey threw in a tricky twist by announcing they wouldn't be selecting their own teams. Instead, the rest of the chefs were asked to choose a side and reveal their preference between the two captains. Oh my gosh, this is just like getting picked for dodgeball in middle school. Ramsey intervened and instructed Terry to transfer three cooks to Nathan's team to balance things out. Terry, next. Unfortunately, I'm going to send Sean over to the other show. With the teams now balanced, 
Terry's red team and Nathan's blue team could finally start cooking. They had two courses to prepare, 150 guests to satisfy, and very little time to accomplish it all. Oh, and to add to the pressure, Ramsey dropped the bombshell saying, First time in MasterChef history, there'll be no pressure test. The stakes were raised, folks. The stakes were raised. The bride and groom requested a scallop appetizer, and so a scallop appetizer they shall receive. Right from the start, the contrasting leadership styles between Terry and Nathan became apparent. If we work together as a team, we can create something amazing. Meanwhile, Nathan was mostly just shouting at people to quiet down. Stop. Nathan, don't yell at Well, obviously, the blue team faced a rocky start in the appetizer round. I need that sauce. I'm straining it right now. Since scallops are delicate and require precise timing, Ramsey was concerned when he saw Barbara already searing the scallops before the ceremony had even begun. You can't cook them now. Nick's not even married yet. As Nathan spiraled into chaos, Jean tried to seize control of the situation. Everybody just relax, and we're going to win this damn competition. In other words, there was a power struggle. Trust Nathan. me. Yes, chef. Trust me. He's trying to talk to me. You can't talk to me. But the blue team continued to face other issues, too. They struggled to plate quickly. Barbara's vinaigrette turned out awful. And some scallops were still undercooked. Just your typical team meltdown scenario. Look at the dining room out there. You're not f***ing Nelson. There's nothing coming out. Yeah, so on to the main course. Meanwhile, the red team sailed through service smoothly. They encountered a minor hiccup when strong winds knocked over some plates ready to be served. We're not going to be able to get these plates out on time. But they quickly recovered. Terry had everything firmly under control. The guests seemed pretty impressed with the red team's dishes as well. Their scallops were cooked to perfection, and the sauce received rave reviews. The sauce here on the red was super elegant. Yeah. Unfortunately, the blue team still couldn't solve their squabble. Nathan, calm down. And this is when Ramsey tried injecting some order. You are expediting. Yes, chef. This is your team. But wait till you see how that went down. Seriously? Oh my gosh. Who made that vinaigrette? It was bad. So bad that Ramsey said, It looks like something out of a f sewer. Not surprising that they failed to get all their dishes out on time. Chef, I have a question. I know I have a f question right now. And the ones that did make it were criticized for being bland. Like you said, you could use definitely more seasoning, a little bland. I mean, the blue team seriously needed to pull themselves together before the next course if they wanted to stand any chance of winning. They're not working together, Gordon. He's putting out a raw scallop. Credit to Nathan, he took Ramsey's highly constructive criticism on board and had a heart to heart with his teammates. I gotta be a better team captain. I gotta step it up. I do not wanna let them down. I mean, he even shared a hug with Sean. It finally looked like everything was going to be just fine. Surprisingly, it's not the lamb that gave the blue team trouble. It was their orzo. Now, DeAndre was in charge of this dish, claiming to be an orzo expert. Job is perfect for me. We got this. But unfortunately, he seemed to only excel at burning the bottom of the pan. Oh my god, it's burnt. Oh my gosh. Round one, Nathan would have had a complete meltdown over this. But round two, Nathan was much more zen. I'm just going to breathe and work through this. His team rallied together to salvage what they could of the Orso. Do you want to start over? No, we don't have time. On the other hand, the red team encountered major issues with their protein. I can't relax, I gotta go! Relax. When Ramsey checked in for service, he noticed pieces of raw meat. Just touch that, just touch it. It's too cold, dang it. It's raw. He calmly peers, pointed out their mistake, and instructed them to rectify the issue before serving any food to the guests, or else, as he put it. I swear to God, I'm gonna cancel the whole thing. The threat served its purpose, though, and the red team managed to bring their rack of lamb up to the required standard. Conversely, the red team's feedback was the complete opposite. The lamb fell short, but the other components of the dish stood out. Having crust envy yes, from the blue team's lamb. But guess what? As always, the results were declared with a surprising twist. So, 
Will the bride throw the blue or red bouquet? Yes, the first team challenge of the season went to Terry and the red team, which meant someone from Nathan's team was facing elimination. But Ramsey and Christina had some other plans. Sean, team would have been lost without you. Thank you, chefs. Surprisingly, team captain Nathan was spared too. With your tenacity, you are safe from elimination. Well, I think many of their issues stemmed from Nathan's oversight. Do you agree? Let me know what you think in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure to drop a like, subscribe, and turn on the post notifications. And if you want to watch another mind-bending video, then make sure to check out this next post right here. It's even crazier.